Yeah, welcome everyone for our cloud computing and big data course. Today is practical lecture 0.1, and we have a very short introduction to Python and Jupyter. Maybe here in the classroom, who has used Python before? Okay, almost everybody these days. Okay, Jupyter notebooks by chance, also the majority here in class. And please feel free in the chat for the online audience to also make your voice heard and enter this into the chat. How many people of you have maybe used Python and Jupyter? So I think I keep it then very short introductionary topics here uh, today. But before we go into the material of that lecture, just let us shortly review what we did the last time in the prologue. So the prologue was essentially um, just motivating the course, right? It was the idea of having the information from 10,000 feet perspective, um, what we will cover roughly in the course, why it's a good timing for the course. Um, this is something what we had discussed. And the other aspect of it was in the course organization and the content. So firstly, for the course motivation, we said it's really a great time. We have kind of three key ingredients, if you want, that we said like there's lots of data around um, these days, um, what we call big data, which doesn't always reflect volume. It also reflects velocity, veracity, other key factors that we will talk about. And the interesting thing is the storage doesn't cost so much anymore. So we can keep these data, we can keep big storages. Um, the second movement, which actually contribute why this course is so timely is the hardware. So we have now basically GPU processing units, like 10 years ago, these were used for gamings. Now we have them really at large scale available in clouds to really do processing with it, to really do number crunching, not for gaming, but for really, you know, either business logic or for scientific applications. So you would say that this is the second kind of key ingredient why the course is very timely. And I believe most of you heard from NVIDIA GPUs they are, of course, by far in the moment, the market leader, but there are many GPUs that are coming that are basically hopefully then get to a more heterogeneous landscape in this. And the third, which is really also remarkable in a way, is the software, because here we really have lots of open source and free software packages. I told you in the prologue that students from me, they basically manually programmed artificial neural networks, right, like five, six years ago and did this with MPI to paralyze it, to make it scalable, very complicated, do your own programming, student by student. And now you just download, right? You download Keras, you download TensorFlow, you download PyTorch. And these are all brilliant packages for doing deep learning, for instance. Deep learning is a little bit here, a small highlight in the course, and because it shows you very nicely how big data cloud comes together with cloud computing. But we also said that this is not a machine learning course, nor a deep learning course. So you still have to, if you're interested in these topics, still use maybe some other courses. We keep here the, let's say, level of machine learning and um, deep learning to a moderate degree, right? There are other courses from Magnus, for instance, for deep learning here, uh, which is also a very good course. Now, when you put that all together, how that relates now to cloud computing, in a way you see a little bit here, the idea um, of the application example of machine learning. Once the data set data set volume really grows towards big data, you really come into trouble with, let's say, serial computing that you might now on your computer like R or MATLAB or Octave that you do normally on your laptop, even with Python and Jupyter, you have limits because essentially this beautiful laptop here has some memory limit or basically not so much capacity to put just here four, eight, 16 or 256 GPUs inside. And of course, this is exactly what the cloud gives you. Right, so the more big data you have, you need more capacity, where, while storage would be not the biggest problem, the memory and the computing capacity is. So traditional learning models also still play a role. It's not that deep learning rolls everything up now and says this is a modus operandi. Basically what we have see today is it's really still used, especially of course, when you have small data sets, right? So this field here is also an area where largely still in the small data sets, um, essentially traditional learning models still are very relevant. Now, basically also saying that the ordering here in terms of the accuracy you see on the left side is not accurate on the left part, right? So this is something which is different. But once you do deep learning, for instance, and larger neural networks, you directly see directly the cloud impact in terms of training time. So you need much more computing capacity, which is this red footprint here. And this motivates essentially the course. Whenever you basically are in need of more processing capability that your laptop can offer, 
the cloud or HPC machines are basically the way to go. And the more sophisticated you do, basically, in terms of learning models, like large deep learning networks, ResNet 50, um, really complicated networks with billion of parameters, you basically would end up for days training a laptop, right? So, and of course, the cloud enables you to use different GPUs in parallel in order to break down then the speed of training it. But this is all material that will materialize step by step in the course. We'll have a deep learning lecture and then also applications of deep learning and also looking a little bit how GPUs really solve these issues. This was kind of the key motivation. We will also look at other mo uh, motivational applications, of course, especially when we think about all the public clouds that we have, Amazon, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. We will look a little bit in academic clouds with the European Open Science Grid. But all of these have different applications and different unique selling propositions. So we will pick, for instance, Angry Birds as one example in one of the lectures, and then basically also the infrastructural aspects in another lecture. So this will be a kind of beautiful mix between different areas, just that you learn the different clouds. And also in the assignments, you will to learn uh, basically you use really different cloud systems uh, that we have here. We start actually next week already in Microsoft Azure. Now, the other part of the course organization was essentially what we discussed, like exams, assignment, and so forth, and that basically everything is in Canvas. So this is really a tool where everybody from you needs to have access to. There's a small exception with a so-called ad discussion tool that we currently establish. Piazza was running out of service for here, uh, basically, because it got too expensive. So we bought an ad license now and get used to it, and you will basically receive some information about it soon. So again, the course is the logo suggests are in a way very Python based. Um, we really need here and there Python, but you don't have to be an expert in Python, right? We discussed it with some of you last time that Python is helpful to know, but we also basically have usual walkthroughs of scripts. So it will be never a big programming assignment. Please program this and that all in Python. But of course it's important to understand Python here and there to also understand how you use basically the scripts in the different clouds. But this will be part of the assignment and also one reason why we do the small Python introduction here. But as I see, at least from the uh, in-house audience here, we have the most already being familiar with Python. And I can also recommend that there's a strong movement, at least in the data scientists towards Python. Now from the outline of the course, um, today is really this additional practical lecture that I do again and again, mostly related to assignments so that you know already how to do it, do the assignment in a practical fashion. So around these topics, you will consider more and more of this practical, basically lectures that will come up. I also pointed to YouTube already. The course 2020 is online in YouTube completely. So there you see already different practical lectures if you want, or basically how the course will evolve. Of course, I will add and remove some elements which are, let's say, not really more relevant or which are new. We also have new discussions with a new partner called Ed North here in Iceland. They do data centers here. And we try also to integrate some Icelandic material here just also to boost the local um, business. Okay, but essentially 80, 90% is very similar like the course you had in 2020. Let's come now to the topic of today. I will just briefly then go to the Python environments as a majority of you already have knowledge there. I think we can keep that to, let's say, a moderate degree. Much more important than always to understand that we have a local setup of cloud computing tools, which is Jupyter, Anaconda. We'll come to that in a moment. And then we also have essentially the idea of using this in a remote cloud where, you know, this is not on your laptop anymore, but it feels like it is in the cloud. And of course, this is an interesting topic. And I will demonstrate it to you um, by using the Yuli Supercomputing Center cloud that we have there available. It's called the Helmholtz Data Federation. I come to that. But this is really to understand basically also the cloud concept. The cloud concept is not that you have to be abstract just as this age protocol we will talk about in one of the lectures, very, let's say, um, uh, hardcore programming, low level. You can also use a cloud very conveniently from your laptop as if it would be on your laptop itself. Of course, what you need is the internet connection. I think that goes without saying, without this, um, there's no chance of really using cloud computing. And then I will give you some demonstrations, um, variables, hello world statements. We probably can do this very quickly as you most of you are know. But then maybe here we can see a little bit more time of these packages, the 
importance of using Python with different libraries, with different machine learning packages, and having an example of data exploration just to get a feeling for it, what Jupyter can do and the notebooks can do. So let's go. Um, of course, it goes without saying just a disclaimer here that this is not a complete Python or Jupyter tutorial, right? The idea is just to get you briefly up to speed, what you probably know um, already in the majority of the cases, but also what you need for the assignments to work. So when we look at Python environments, um, they are really apparent um, almost everywhere today. When you go to the HPC course, you have C mostly or um, Fortran still. And HPC means usually you have numerical methods based on known physical laws. You have basically a complete different situation of codes, right? Weather prediction is an old Fortran code, for instance, very funny in a way. But still, when you now go to the data sciences area, Python is the normal, is basically the way to go. So there's no way around it. Of course, some tools that we use then in parallel fashions are programmed in C. We once did a C program for, let's say, highly scalable DBSCAN clustering, which is an unsupervised learning mechanism in machine learning. And we still have the most scalable version from us, and we programmed that in C. But the majority, SkyKit Learn and so on, are really in, in Python. So, and when you think about now this role um, of Python just as a programming language, really, um, this has nothing to do with the interface, essentially. That, that's where Jupyter comes in. Of course, you want to use this computing resources that I was alluding to in the prologue already, um, that yeah, there will be like HPC or cloud resources very conveniently as this would be your laptop. That's why the Jupyter um, notebooks are there. Um, which are actually extensible to its so-called Jupyter Labs that we will talk about today for a multi-user environment. So this is a very important aspect of it um, because then otherwise the clouds would be, you know, not convenient to lose. And one of the um, the interesting things to, to use really cloud computing resources is this convenient usage we will explore again and again in Amazon and MS Azure and also the, the setup of those, which are basically very easy to set up once you, of course, have your credit card right, right? So this will be also something we talked about, of course, for you here in the course, there's not a requirement to have a credit card, but usually, of course, their key motivation is that you swipe your credit card and then like Netflix and so on, you get the cloud. And with this, of course, have much to pay. Um, here in the course, we get educate resources. So don't worry about this. This is all, let's say, of course, free, but in the real world outside the cost factor of Cloud computing is really very, very important to consider. Now, coming back then to Python, as most of you know, um, it's a very flexible programming language. Um, you see with here, hello world, just a couple of lines. You can really do hell a lot of things. But the interesting thing is we will have a data mining example at the end of today when I show also with a couple of lines of a machine learning or slash data mining code, you can do hell a lot of things like having a shop owner already help with, you know, which shop uh, basically elements are bought mostly with other products together and things like that. So it's a very flexible and extremely powerful language at the same time. However, we have to say that most of the power of Python comes from the different libraries, right? So this is, of course, a very flexible language, but in the end, what makes Python also so powerful is the community around it. There are people programming TensorFlow usable in Python. There are people having NumPy, which is a, let's say, a, a really a tool which almost always in data sciences is used in all the different codes for handling matrices, vectors, arrays, multidimensional arrays, and so forth. So, of course, the libraries are very powerful, and we will also introduce you to ML Extend, the machine learning library that you will use in your um, assignments, but we have a small sneak demo today. And then you can go on and go on. Keras is a top library on TensorFlow and PyTorch just to make the coding a bit faster, but also usable in Python. So this is definitely something which we um, leverage in this course. But of course, you could use cloud computing also without Python. But just let's say that here with the drive of the data science in the course as the examples, we basically focus a little bit on that. Now, when you think about the um, idea, how you would program this, and also thinking about now um, how you think about how machine learning works, um, I just want to start a little bit with explaining the differences, of course. 
you know maybe Java or C who has programmed on Java and C here in the class, almost also everyone. You know, basically what you do there is you have some ideas to do something with, you know, data. You have so-called rules where you say you want to have this function, you work on this data, and there should be something coming out. Print the bill based on all the transactions. That's fine. And then you get some answers, basically in classical programming, answers in terms of, okay, the bill is printed, something like this. So you program explicitly, program logic rules what you want to do. Now, when you consider this now, um, how machine learning works, it's quite the opposite. So in the end, you don't really have yet the idea why the data was generated this way or what basically you want to get out of the data. All what you have is you have some algorithms, some answers that you put in, basically some uh, ideas how to handle the data. And what you get out is then some rules that gave rise to that data, right? An example is, again, if you think of, for instance, Netflix, right? So Netflix has lots of user data coming in, and they know a lot about um, basically what um, data is all related and what users and so on will use that data. So they have lots of these different things come in, but there's no logic behind it. So nobody sells you, if you look this Western, you also look that Western. And this is the idea of, of course, in machine learning to find out your personality. What is the rule behind it, right? And this gave rise to the data in the first place that, you know, many users, you know, prefer, for instance, this particular niche in the data Netflix, for instance. It's just important to understand that basically both of these classical programming are a little bit different, you know, from the approaches that we do in machine learning. Of course, we have a Python script in machine learning. That means we program a little bit explicitly, but during the course you will learn it has a complete different style of programming, essentially. It's very data oriented, not program logic oriented. So we do it, you know, separation to training and test set. I will allude this a little bit today, just shortly. Um, before we basically see then some examples uh, in the second part of the course today. Now NumPy is, a, is basically one of the key packages that's why I brought in. Who has used NumPy maybe from you? I guess those who use Python almost always use NumPy also, especially if you're in academic scenarios. So you see it's a very nice library um, used for, for very many things. And here are some of the application examples that you already have seen. Um, it's basically very nice to work with vectors, with matrices and, and machine learning, big data, especially in very different areas. It has strong, um, basically, support of different areas in science and engineering, but also for business and statistics, for instance, what you use often there. Uh, there's a huge support for, for many of these. So NumPy is something which always, basically, also our packages will use. Not all of them are using the pandas. Who has used that? Maybe it's also a very popular package. Basically, it's a little bit less, okay, but understandable. So here it's really when you have really data sets to produce, um, but it's also getting more and more popular than just using, let's say, um, arrays and so on. The frame is basically a data structure that you can easily manipulate, that you can work nicely with. Um, it can be used in different areas, you see, essentially creating one here for an example out of a CSV, a comma separated file. We will come to this example in the second half of the course hours today when we have, let's say, retail data sets. It's very easy to just read that in a so-called uh, data frame from Pandas. And um, yeah, so it's used basically again in many different packages. Now coming to deep learning frameworks, um, I'm not sure who has used TensorFlow here. Perhaps, okay, now the, the hands are getting very little. So I know some people have machine learning experience probably. And Keras, it's an on top framework on top of TensorFlow a little bit, okay, yeah. So these are already going to a world of very specific packages, right? So here we, we talk really about very specific ones for artificial neural networks, deep learning, auto encoders, so the world really of data sciences in that field. And the beauty is still they are all open source, right? Remember, it's quite complicated to program those. And uh, in, in previous times, these were not existing. So it's very nice to have those tools. Said this, um, these are just two examples of around maybe 20 to 30 packages which are around now. So it's keep increasing. There's MMXNet, 
Um, PyTorch is not here. Uh, we will have another slide about this when we talk about lecture six and lecture seven, then much more in detail what deep learning is about and you know what machine learning and artificial neural networks have together with it. So this is something where, of course, um, we will talk about. Of course, in this course, we not only talk about how TensorFlow works and Keras in terms of neural networks and deep learning. Here, the idea is really to think about how are now GPUs in the cloud utilized? Why TensorFlow is really very much good to use with CPUs, uh, with GPUs, but not with CPUs. So things like this are very important and the clouds can of course help you there. In case you, for instance, have no GPUs, it's really makes sense to move in the cloud. Google Colab, for instance, is a, is a free resource for GPUs for everyone. You don't get the same GPU all the time. It varies which one, so Kepler's uh, or sometimes Volta's, but still um, it's a very good resource to do basically deep learning using GPUs. And we will talk about this much more in detail, just to give you a key theme that the libraries in Python, and basically you would use TensorFlow and Keras with Jupyter Notebooks, also in one of the assignments in the cloud. This is really orthogonal through the course, right? The Python packages and libraries are everywhere. Just again, reiterating a little bit on deep learning. Um, we had this a little bit also in the prologue where you said what is now the the news essentially out of this, why it's so attractive to do. Um, this is essentially here saying that in the 60s, 70s, neural networks were already great. They were looking a little bit like this. So it would have neurons organized in the input output layer and hidden layers, but you would have a limited number of hidden layers. So basically two would be already something, um, you would maybe go to four, but not really deep much. And this is, of course, what deep learning is changing. So um, here you see a very old character recognition, and this will be also something we do in the assignments and together here in the course, you would have these different neurons that fire at different signals when you want to identify a character. So this was already existing, and essentially the computing was okay in the 70s for that. Now, um, by getting more complicated and including more and more hidden layers, the situation changed a bit. So it's much more computing demanding, but, um, and we learn in lecture six and seven why exactly. But of course saying that this was already existing kind of before. Um, but what really new was with deep learning is now that you're not only going deeper, that was this illustration here on the bottom, also for the remote audience, maybe this one alludes to, so the idea is not just going deep in terms of normal neurons and include now 500 hidden layers and keep the structure the same, like a feed forward network. Here we talk about very specialized layers. You see that a little bit illustrated here. This is a cutting edge network in deep learning that is identifying these characters to 99%. And it's not based on just a simple neuron structure. It has convolutional layer feature maps that are learned during the process and basically going to different sample strategies to really the identification of what you see here nicely in this video now, um, the different, let's say, features really, what makes a seven, what makes a six. And the spiking, I think this is still something which is more or less um, an active research field, so it's not so important in the course. Just to realize that deep learning doesn't mean just normal deep from everything you did in the past. It has a really new um, approach with different layers. It has new approaches in sequence modeling, language basically processing. It has basically recurrent neural network structures, which are similar, like in the 70s, but now basically also things like long short term memory aspects. So the structure of those networks is different. And the point in these structures, bringing it back to cloud computing, is it needs heavily processing, right? So this is very, very important to consider. Okay, let us go a bit forward. I think TensorFlow, Tensor is not, I mean, a very sophisticating work for something which is nothing else than a multidimensional array. So I basically just reference this here so that you know what the Tensor term means. And basically one of the initial ideas was that you maybe just start to download Anaconda here. Well, we have three hours together, essentially, three course hours, but you're also welcome to do it your own. I would recommend to do it and maybe use the rest of the third course hour today to just, you know, getting used to this. This is a local package that you can download. Have you, you, someone used Anaconda maybe before? Okay, yeah, also very much, perfect. So this is basically a very good training environment on your local network, right? It has Jupyter, it has the demos that I want to present a little bit. And the similar library 
ideas you find in the cloud computing aspect that we will see. And of course, there the trouble is we don't have really GPUs. So one of the assignments will be showing you what's happened if you don't have the GPUs for really computing a lot. But we will build this up gradually during the course. But as many of you have here already used Anaconda, that's very brilliant. So then I can also get a bit quicker with this. It's a very popular, let's say, collection of tools, really, right? It's not only Python, it has lots of different uh, tools inside. So for thinking about the Jupyter tool, we can maybe do um, this as a small demo. You see here a little bit um, now the, um, the local idea of having this Anaconda framework. And this is a very important consideration. You see here the local host, right? So that means nothing else is running on the laptop. And what we're coming to is essentially something like this, where we then have here Jupyter JC, something in the cloud, which is also accessible via your uh, browser, but remotely in the cloud. But still, essentially, it's all browser-based. It's very simple to, to do. And by doing so, you, you basically have here lots of um, simple basic demonstrations um, that we going through um, either that way or we can basically take it in the second course hour and, and then clarify questions. But before we go this way, um, essentially just this is important to realize with a local host that you basically now are really on your own computer, right? Because there are many questions usually are there with, with people that are unfamiliar with cloud environments and remote environments that this is a big difference if you stay on your own computer or if you basically go to a cloud somewhere. So I think this demonstration, and I keep the demonstrations always a little bit also on the slide so that you basically have that also there, although the recording hopefully should also capture all of that uh, as well. And you know, here basically in the environment, um, when we go to this course, we see here some practical examples, basic examples, for instance, I have here, um, this is, I think, no surprise to you using, for instance, shift enter here for, for doing nice things. You have lots of different functionality essentially here on the top um, from, you know, cleaning the output, restarting the kernel and basically clear the output. These are all basically important elements to, to basically know. Um, many of you are probably also familiar with, you know, the processing in terms of the different elements here. So you see here one, two, this has been executed. If there's an asterisk or star, it is being processed. But the order depends basically on how you execute it. So this is often an error when I have lots of tutorials with people that, you know, people start then suddenly going up again and have then suddenly, let's say, the four here again. Um, we will talk maybe later about this when I do real cool demonstrations and maybe edit here a little bit. But just getting a feeling for that, it's very interactively. But here and there, of course, it also has uh, some problems attached. And the idea is now with the cloud doing very similar things, but remotely, right? And so still keeping the look and feel like that, which is essentially then uh, pushing a lot of technology to be activated on the remote cloud we will talk about in the course, right? It has something to do with authentication, has something to do with, with uh, authorization. On one case, um, you see, for instance, here, the the Jupyter system that we have in, in JC. And let me just, you know, get to this. Just as an example here. Now we're basically switching to the cloud. You see that always here on the on the URI, right? So this is not any more local host. And they are prepared here in the HDF cloud in Jülich already basically something where you also will have access to in one of the assignments, um, a cloud environment. And surprisingly, it will be looking exactly almost like local host, right? And this is a good usability approach. And if you go now to AWS Educate, AWS services, MS Azure, Google Cloud Platform, you always find one way or another to use the Jupyter Notebooks as well. So this is really a, a modus operandi in the moment. However, to getting to it is sometimes different from AWS to MS Azure. So there are really differences in, in how exactly which services you're going to use. And we will talk about this throughout the basically the whole the different course lectures. Um, essentially, when you um, do this here, you see a little bit of difference in terms of the look and feel on the left side, because we have here in the Jülich cloud, 
um, the so-called Jupyter Lab, which is for multi-users. It's not only just a notebook, but you can share data with other users and many different things. And um, you have some notebooks already prepared, some environments, um, and you have a file system connected. So this is, of course, a little bit more sophisticated than just the laptop with all the different tools that you got from Anaconda. And this brings us to this Jupyter Lab. So it's essentially an extension with Jupyter Hub to really go to multiple users to share data and environments. And you see on the right hand side, when you, when you go to a cloud, they always have to do a little bit a different setup of so-called IDM, identity management. This course is not about security. That's why I keep that, of course, just to a very, very small degree, saying that the minute you go remotely, there are lots of big questions coming. So username, you know, have you paid? Have you not paid? How do you get the access? So identity management is a very important thing. Here we manage this in the Jupyter Lab that you're going to use for the assignment here and there um, via so-called LDAP services where you get, you know, your entry via a so-called JUser introduced. And that will all come in all the assignments step by step for a walkthrough. Just that you realize that basically this environment is a big, bigger, bolder, and more secure than just the little Anaconda Jupyter notebooks, right? This is um, already in a kind of element in the cloud. However, wherever you go, essentially in all the different machine learning tutorials we did, um, we did here praise machine learning tutorials. So this is really a very nice to teach, but also essentially to, to take up those things, these scripts that you have, and then maybe reusing it for your own needs. Good, for the demonstration, um, Let's, I plan the most demonstration in the second half just to get you familiar with this. But essentially, like you have here in the cloud now, you see again the URI is here based on some specific user and identity and so on. And now I can really have different pre installed in basically applications used, like Python, for instance. And then I get here the kernel that is basically based on Python. But I can also change and switch the kernels. And you see here, for instance, is one that we prepared also for Python with deep learning. So you can switch the kernels, which means a little bit the packages which are available um, and so on change. And we do a little bit on this also in the second half, um, basically of our course hours or of our lecture today. The remaining one minute or two minutes, we can have also questions maybe. I think there's not much more directly what I can demonstrate here. You see we have different kernels available. Some maybe know the Julia language. It's very getting more and more popular in scientific computing. And of course, JavaScript, I think the most people know. Ruby is another script language and yeah. So, so much for this. Um, Maybe another demonstration would be if you have a lounger here. I'm not sure if everybody of you is familiar with SSH, the SSH protocol. Of course, this is in cloud computing, something we will also use again. Um, here you have directly basically an SSH into the cloud remotely, right? You see host name is not anymore a laptop, but some Jupyter lab node somewhere deep in the cloud. And we don't know exactly where it is, just that it's somewhere in Germany sitting there. Right, but yeah, coming to questions, I see actually also in the chat are questions. Um, let me just maybe get this. I think one of the questions here from Said was, should we get familiar with all these platforms? Are we going to use all these platforms in the course? It's very good questions. And all of these platforms, I guess, which have been there um, noted will be used. So we use Google, Google Platform. We use Google Collab also which is actually different. We use AWS Educate, we use MS Azure next week, actually we're starting with MS Azure. And yeah, so um, what else? EOS we use a little bit, but not so much as academic cloud because the chances are not many of you have basically contact with this, but the biggest player in cloud computing are basically these three Google Cloud, AWS and MS Azure. Um, the second question from uh, Peter Helgi Einason was, do you mean AWS, MS Azure, Spark and Hadoop or the NumPy? So um, I think, wait, let me just, this is complete, Pandas TF frameworks. Okay, so I think all of those um, basically, ah, okay, that was directly to say it. Um, but in the end, um, we will basically use those platforms with tools, right? So the cloud, platforms are one layer like Microsoft um, or basically AWS, 
But another layer is what tools are there. So Spark is just one tool, but it, it happens to be that Spark is basically deployed in all of them. Similar like Jupyter Notebooks, they are basically available everywhere, but they are just tools. So it's another layer And NumPy, of course, and Pandas is then, and TensorFlow Framework is yet another layer. It's inside Python, a library, so to speak, with NumPy and Pandas. And we all will use them in the assignments as well. Good question. Of course, again, this doesn't mean you have to sweep your credit card, right? We get some educational accounts, which are here and there a bit limited. So in this course, we cannot use 200 GPUs like we use in research, but at least we have, let's say, resources which are for free available to us in all the different assignments and in the next lectures. Good, I use the opportunity to ask inside any questions. I will repeat them then for the audience. Yeah, then I would say um, here we have a 10 minutes break and we will continue in 10 minutes. Then we'll see second part of the course with some more demonstrations.